I get because that. I know that I experienced a certain level of grief revisiting some of those books. Okay. Because it's like if I cried a tear for every time my child had a boo boo, I would never stop crying. Yes. You just kind of have to be prepared for that if you're going to read to take it with a grain of salt and realize they're coming from a different lived experience perspective. And the tools are more useful Uh than than the the idea that every boo-boo is going to result in lifelong trauma. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. So take away the the tools. Take away the tools and don't attend to any prognosis. Okay. Stop. Gotcha. Not that, because that's not what's useful. And then the other thing I would say Mm -hmm. is that one of the ways that we can be supportive of kids is attending to their ability to keep themselves safe Mm -hmm. and providing them lots and lots and lots of opportunities to have a say about what happens to their bodies. Have a say. Mm -hmm. Just like right now in the news, we're talking about how kids are allowed to say who hugs them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of been a new novel thing to really talk about consent and touch in children in that way. That's definitely true and especially true for kids where there's a lot of medical intervention. Okay. Is that if you're going to have frequent moments where you don't have a say over what happens to your body, then there needs to be an understanding of why that happens and a reestablishment of trust. So a discussion. You get to have a say. A discussion at the very least, but also opportunities for play uh-huh. in which it's reestablished. Gotcha. Like, that, you were... like the dragon game or whatever. Yeah. You have to reestablish, reestablish in a language that resonates with your the, uh, your child's developmental level mm-hmm. that every person has a right to protect themselves physically. And then there's also when you're going in and out of sedation or seizure, it is helpful to use safe sensory cues to okay. whatever degree is tolerable to the child. Not all kids like touch. Not all kids like sound. Sometimes what is soothing to a person is less impact right. rather than more. But if you figure out what kind of sensory experience is the most soothing to your child and uh-huh. create a way for them to orient into sedation or seizure uh-huh. and orient out. Whether okay. that's a song that you sing to them, whether that's physical touch, being able to feel your edges, feel your skin, because your skin is kind of the first Edge. boundary that you have. Interesting. I've never heard it defined um, that way. And you definitely see pressure, right? There's something about that that is really organizing to a child. Uh-huh. Hearing your voice get into that melodic up and down prosody of voice place uh-huh. is organizing. Some kids are really cued well by certain smells or uh-huh. go through your sensory diet and you think, how many sensory things can I layer in that will orient my child to know that even if they're experiencing something that is confusing, they're experiencing that confusion in a safe environment, uh-huh. right? Okay. Yeah. In a safe container. And your voice is going to convey safety one one of the things that's super interesting as a trauma therapist is hearing the number of kids who mention the scary face on mom <laughs> or dad that stayed uh, with them in this kind of locked up scary experience. It wasn't just that they were scared. It's that they saw mommy's face and mommy was super scared. Uh, right? Yeah. And so I think if your kid is going through something medical that's scary, The more that you can do to kind of check in with yourself, Mm -hmm. self-regulate yourself as much as possible and layer in that they're going to be okay. It's okay. This, this may be painful and then you're, you know, you're going to feel the pain and then you're going to feel something else Uh and it's going to be okay. And we're having to do this for a reason and we got you. Yes. The more that you can layer that in. And that's important, not just for the kid, but also for the parent, because one of the hardest things for parents sometimes is this issue of feeling unable to protect your kid or unable to help. Yes. If you're taking charge of layering in resilience for your kid or laying, layering in, Hey, I can't, I can't protect you in all of these different ways, but I can protect you by singing this song to you and making my face really safe and letting you know that you're going to be okay with my body language. Then that's something that the parent can do, right? Yes. Yes. 
that makes the parent feel capable instead of feeling that collapse experience, out of which control. all of us feel to a certain degree at certain points, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think that can be really useful for both parent and child. Those are good. And nursing, honestly, is a beautiful experience to whatever degree that ends up happening. Oh, yeah. I nursed, I nursed um, my child. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, my oldest daughter, she had, a, she had a lot of medical stuff going on related to TSC. I remember just nursing her right before her EEG, nursing her through her any kind of pers- – I was always there nursing her because she nursed till she was almost two. <laughs> Yeah. And I really am grateful that I did that because it was, I can see now looking back, it definitely helped her, helped me feel like she was getting something from me that was reassuring during these, these traumas. So yeah. And then the other big thing too is there, if there's an opportunity, if it's possible for you to go back with the child before they go under sedation, that's something to fight for. Go back. Like if sometimes they'll let you Oh, before uh, they, it happens. Sometimes they won't let you go back for surgery. A certain level, you can go back to where they put the mask on ah, the kid yeah. before they go under sedation. Yep. And it's amazing how much doctors will sometimes fight you on that. But to whatever degree you can fight back for that, that's something that's worth doing because it's scary to be with strangers who are strapping a mask to your face. <laughs> you think? So one other thing that's worth mentioning is that Sometimes your child is having to do something that is stressful or uncomfortable. And, um, and so in that moment, your child needs your eye contact and your child needs your comfort. You're trying to do your trauma support and a medical professional will come in. And personally, mm-hmm. this is one of my biggest pet peeves. Oh, I can relate. Because that's not fair to the child, right? In that yeah. moment, they're needing their parent. They're needing, you know, comfort. And because the doctor wears a white coat, there's this assumption that, you know, your child gets to go on pause and you get to give your eye contact and your full attention to that doctor. And that is not, that is, you do not have any sort of obligation in that moment to prioritize the doctor. They are there to provide medical care to your child and your child is a complete person, not a set of body parts. And your child may need you in that moment. And so Uh one thing that you can do is say no. Say, I wanna give you the doctor my full attention and I will be able to give you my full attention when my child does not actively need me right now. Mm-hmm. But my child actively needs me right now. So we need to have this conversation in 10 minutes or an hour or whenever the child is done with the medical thing that they need. And it seems like doctors are, doctors seem more aware of that when the child will kind of verbally protest. But if you have a nonverbal kid or if you have a child who expresses distress in other ways. Atypical ways. In atypical ways, sometimes the doctor won't catch the cue. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you as a parent don't catch that cue. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So so I I, I think it's per- perfectly reasonable and perfectly acceptable. Absolutely. To, to follow the child in that moment and to push back a little. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, and I can think of many instances where I felt torn. So it's good to hear it, hear it out loud that it is, it definitely needs to be prioritized in that moment. One of the things that can cause trauma is too many stressful things happening too fast. Okay. So the more that you can create spaces between steps, the better. Uh huh. For example, if there's a way to kind of do one hard part, take a break, and then do kind of the second hard part. Like then in that's an MRI, better than, take a break when they're doing between brain and kidney. If the child is awake, yeah, you know. I was just thinking of an example. And, yeah, that, if child is awake uh-huh. and they're not enjoying it and they want a break, then yeah. that's a place where they can take a break. Making sure that you don't have a gang of people holding down a kid is yeah. also, I would think that any person would have nightmares about having people 
hold them down. But that does happen oh, yeah. to kids when they're fighting sedation or fighting whatever. You end up having sometimes situations where a group of people hold down a kid. Lying down while being held down is more traumatic than sitting up and having somebody stabilize you. Okay. So if you can have a single person stabilize a child while they're sitting up, that's preferable. If you're making sure that the hospital is also a setting for childhood. <laughs> yeah. Is, I mean, I don't know if you know Claire Wineland. She's a person who had cystic fibrosis who recently passed away, okay. who was amazingly wonderful. She gave these wonderful talks as a motivational speaker about what it was like to live while dying and how she experienced her childhood in hospitals and she oh, made it a place to be happy and play. What's right? her name again? I'm sorry. Claire Wineland. Listen okay. to her talks because she has a bunch of them on YouTube. And like I said, she recently passed away, but she was amazing. And she created a foundation that helps cystic fibrosis patients get to travel. Uh -huh. which can be really difficult with all the equipment and all that kind of stuff. Sounds. Talked about, like, creating a life while uh -huh. uh. she would decorate her room, her hospital room, so that it looked like a happy, fun place to be. Uh -huh. And she talked about when they had the machine that was tapping on her chest or whatever so that she could breathe, she would draw and kind of have that squiggly drawing be part of what made the art fun. Uh huh. She really focused on making sure that hospital was not, that the hospital was not a pause in her childhood, that uh -huh. the hospital was a setting for a childhood. And the more that we can do that, I think that's, yeah, that's important. And any kind of resources that you can send back with a child, sometimes they'll let a child go back with a lovey. We all have symbols that are scary symbols and we all have symbols that are safety symbols. Uh huh. And one of the things that can be hard with medical stuff is that sometimes safety symbols end up looking like scary symbols if they, rem yeah. if they remind us of the diagnosis in the first place. Like right. Feeding tubes are a perfect example of that. Feeding tubes keep kids safe. They are wonderful, yes. beautiful things. If they weren't there, the child would be in significantly more danger than they are there. But there's something about seeing feeding tube sometimes that can turn it into a scary symbol uh -huh. rather than that. safety symbol. Uh -huh. So we're able to change our we, interpretation. And I'll leave you with one last concept, and that's the concept of titration, okay? okay? When we're talking about helping a person organize, to organizing after trauma, if you talk about, and all of us have had this experience going in kind of the mommy Facebook page or, or mm -hmm. whatever, where sometimes if you go into the trauma and you just keep going into the trauma, the trauma gets bigger. The trauma becomes this vortex that sucks you in. Oh, yeah. And you end up feeling a lot worse than you did when you, <laughs> when you started, right? Yes. Talking about the worst moment of your life does not heal trauma. Okay. okay. Yeah. Being able to go back and forth between and what's scary and what's safe. I like to think of it like Hansel and Gretel. You, when you go into the woods, the trauma woods, then you need to put out breadcrumbs and you don't go any deeper into trauma woods than you can without getting back out, right? The most important Ooh. thing is being able to get back out. Uh-huh. That's good. And so when you're imagining that a child is going to have to work a trauma, the more things that you can layer in that can help them be able to to notice something neutral or something safe about the experience, uh -huh. the better. So the really nice emergency worker who had a dinosaur sticker on their tag and you really notice the dinosaur sticker uh, and enjoy the dinosaur sticker, uh -huh. the dinosaur sticker can be a resource, right? Yes. Or noticing that you like this blue paint in the wall is a resource or noticing the smell of mom's perfume is a resource. Or And these are all simple things, nothing. Yeah, that's what I appreciate, the DYI aspect of uh, uh, Silly games and yeah. songs, you know, uh -huh. and, and having that sense that somebody was there that cared, that's useful for parent and kid. There are yeah. lots of parents who will talk about that one nurse who checked in with them and cared or 
the person who gave them their 